Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 27, The Predator. This is the next instalment in our pernicious PhD supervisor series and thank you so much for the amazing feedback that I've been getting from you all. It's just been so inspiring and what you've been sharing with me is the importance of being able to locate a particular set of behaviours label or name those behaviours and know that you're not on your own, that it is a shared experience, a shared taxonomy. And a big shout out, of course, to the wonderful Shay, who is offering me incredible feedback every single week. You rock Shay. But the Predator post this week is tough. It is a little bit different. So I just wanted to preface my comments with a couple of sentences, if I can. If you are one of the millions upon millions upon millions of human beings who have suffered abuse and trauma and harassment, then perhaps this week your relationship with this video is a bit different. You may like to sit with somebody and watch this post, pausing it, having a conversation with somebody. You may want to have a live conversation with me after this session and I'm incredibly happy to do that with you. I am a trained sexual harassment, sexual assault investigator, so I welcome the opportunity to talk with you. But look, you might also be in a place today where you simply cannot manage this conversation. So what I'd ask is have a pause, have a think, take a breath and work out if you're in a place to have this conversation today. And if you're not, stop the post and I'll see you next week for the Chihuahua. My respects always. Okay, so let's take a breath and let's get into this one. Now I'm going to start with a short definition of a predator. Then I'm going to present a couple of stories to show you what this looks like. Then I'm going to investigate the research about the predator and finish off with five strategies for students to be able to understand and to manage this most toxic and dreadful of situations. So the predator is a human who has power and wants to increase their power. This power is increased by creating a stage creating a theatre, creating an alternative world and running a series of scenarios or plays in this imagined world. And these scenarios exist to disconnect you from your family, from your friends, from the truths and the narratives that you've taken for granted through your life. These other relationships away from the predator, those relationships are rendered toxic in this alternative world. Therefore, the predator becomes your only savior and your only friend, the only person that you can trust. They create a world for you, but in this world, you are exploited, you are ridiculed, you experience gaslighting, you are demeaned, you are rendered frightened, and you are rendered vulnerable. So while the white pointer shark supervisor was a scavenger, that meant that they made use of whatever they came across, the predator is different. The predator actually constructs a world. And this world that's been constructed intentionally hurts and demeans students, colleagues, and all other people around them. The point of the predator is to destroy, is to harm, and those actions are enacted to enforce and reinforce and increase the power that they hold. Now, this power is enhanced through sexual harassment, through sexual assault, research misconduct, bullying, and the construction of toxic mental health environments for other people. Now, this is a very serious situation. It not only destroys PhDs, it destroys lives. It's not only geared at, by the way, PhD students. PhD students, if you will, are merely entrees 
for the predator. The predator destroys entire departments. I was in one of these departments for 10 years and an empowered man, <laughs> a full professor, just kept sleeping with students. <laughs> It was just taken for granted. He would just continually sleep with students. But he used to also pick off vulnerable women academics and the spouses of men academics in the department. And can I say, these women all had children as well. So what he used to do, create this scenario, this alternative reality, where he was Prince Charming to these women, remembering that he intentionally selected unhappy and vulnerable women going through a difficult time in their lives. And he would court them. He would care for them. And then he would sleep with them. And the moment that he did that, he informed their husbands and partners that he had had sex with their wives. Marriages would be destroyed, families would crumble, not once, but over and over and over again. He did this not for the sex, well not completely for the sex, but for the power that he gained over other senior men. To quote Bob Dylan, women were merely pawns in the game. And he was never disciplined for it. Indeed, he was celebrated for his contribution to research and teaching at the university when he retired. And these women, can I say these magnificent women, were left to pick up the pieces and they survived. And many of them went on to thrive. How inspiring is that? Now, I know all of this because I was a reasonably junior woman in this department and those women confided in me because I wasn't a threat to anybody. But having said that, the gossip spread throughout the entire university. This example shows you that the predator is not in this for the sex or the research publications. They're in it for the power. The predator wants power and will chew up vulnerable people, students, colleagues, to build this power. So let me give you a story now of a predator and a PhD student. In a reasonably new field, a reasonably new discipline in higher education, a young woman came to see me to report some shocking behaviour. Her supervisor continued to behave oddly to force her into very strange situations. He was endlessly touching her clothes, touching her hoodie around her face and sort of forcing her to go shopping with him to get in his car. And once other students had left for the day, this supervisor would come into the student office and sit on the desk quite closely to her. And he also visited her at home and knocked on her door. So as you can see, this is a drip, 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 drip feeling of weirdness and fear. Now she was a, a young country woman moving to the city to complete her PhD and she was so frightened and you need to hang on to yourself here she was so frightened that she put up butcher's paper on the windows of her house so that he wouldn't know if she was there if he came to visit and she simply stopped going to her work office. Now this man was a predator and it became very, very clear that there's some history here. There were historic cases of this behaviour as well, with at least seven other women complaining about this man. So a process was enacted, but there was insufficient evidence, and this is going to become important later on, there was insufficient evidence to do anything beyond this formal review. Now remember, both the stories I've told you were in one case a couple of decades and in one case a few years before the Me Too movement. How could this happen? How could this happen in a university? Now the first thing I need to say to you is predators are all genders and all sexualities and victims 
are all genders and all sexualities. Remember, this is about power. It's not about sex. But there is a reason why heterosexual men currently and in the past have dominated most of these cases that we talk about. And let me provide the sociology for you. Why do heterosexual men dominate these cases? Well, here we go. I am 53 years of age and I enrolled in my first university degree when I was just 18, 18 and three weeks of age. And my entire department of people that taught me, except for two academics, were men in their late 40s, 50s, and yes, 60s. So men in their late 40s, 50s and 60s would be lecturing in many courses to hundreds of 18, 19 and 20 year old women. Now in no other context in life do that many young women present themselves to men in their 40s, 50s and 60s also noting the power differential between a teacher and a student. Now, many disciplines, and I'm talking particularly about the hard sciences, so the experimental sciences, theoretical sciences at the time, and to be frank, still currently, were dominated by men as both academics and students. Doesn't mean that predator behavior doesn't happen, but it manifests in a different way. But there were, and indeed there are, so senior, so few senior women professors in our universities and above that we've got a very odd situation happening in higher education. We've got older men as teachers and younger women as students in many disciplines. Now, the world has changed in the last 20 years. 30 years. Absolutely. More women academics are reaching levels of seniority and teaching students and there's a much greater diversity of age and ages in every degree. And that means we've got a greater diversity of students with regard to rainbow students, with regard to ethnicity and race and different life experiences and consciousness. This diversity has changed the world and it is changing our universities. But still, the senior professors remain to this day dominated by men and now since 2017 in many nations, doctoral programs are dominated by women. So you see what's happening? A new scenario, a new dynamic has been set up between PhD supervisors and advisors and PhD students. That is the new theatre for predatory behaviours. And that's why in the last five years, we've seen increasing policing and policy interventions in graduate education. And can I also note, just a reminder again, this is not about women, this is not about men, this is about power. And I particularly wanted to note the bullying, the predatory behaviour that is emerging in our research with regard to trans students and non-binary identifying students. This area is being studied and there is a lot of new material emerging in the last three years. And we're gonna talk about a bit of that in a sec. The daily abuse that's being confronted by the trans community, the non-binary identifying community, staff and students is toxic, it's relentless, and it's wrong and it's going to be visible in our gig today. So again, just a reminder, this is not about straight gay, this is not about men or women. This is about power and it is about how our universities are set up at the moment. Heterosexual men are in power and students are younger, poorer and less experienced than they are. And these wonderful students, you, you're wanting leadership <laughs> You're wanting guidance, you're wanting compassion, and you're wanting advice about the next stage of your lives. So universities really are one of the very few areas left in life where a 50-year-old man will have mostly women in their teens, late teens, or early 20s in a classroom. Now, the overwhelming majority of these men are magnificent human beings. De de they're decent, they're ethical, they're compassionate and feminist. That's the overwhelming majority of men in our lives. Wonderful human beings. But there is a chunk 
of heterosexual men, including some very famous cases of vice chancellors sexually harassing and sexually attacking their own staff. And so that sort of leadership model <laughs> renders our system brittle and open and available for accountability and review. So let me just raise one more key issue for your consideration. Now, I have views on this issue that I've presented so far in this post, but I also want to acknowledge the different view and the evidence for you. I never present just my view in this. I try and always present for you the full evidence. You're a bright person. You can make your own mind up. So let's run the alternative argument for you now. In higher education, it is higher education, all our students are above the age of consent. So students can legally consent to sexual intercourse or intimate relationships with anybody else who also consents. So let's use the extreme example. An 18 year old student can consent to have sex with a 60 year old person as long as both sides consent. That is legal. That is legal. Now, of course, they're, they're agreeing to that. There's a consensual relationship in place. Thanks for playing. And there are many academics today having relationships with undergraduates and postgraduate students. And there are many examples, tens of thousands of examples, where academics have married their previous PhD students. Okay. So, those scenarios is what creates all the messiness and the brittleness and the anger in these sort of cases. Similarly, it can be argued that the university is a workplace. PhD students are workers in that workplace. We all spend so much time in this workplace. Students and supervisors share a whole series of interests. So it's not surprising that intimate relationships emerge. Now, the legal and consent issue matters a great deal here. You may disagree with it, I may disagree with it, but it is important that it is logged. The countervailing argument is because of the power differential between academics and students, consent is not actually possible. And that mitigating space between those two arguments that I've just presented for you, that's where research and policy interventions are required. Regulation is required. So let's talk about those public accountability measures now. In 2016 in Australia, the Respect Now Always report was released by Universities Australia and around the world, the Me Too movement resulted in universities creating new research strategies and policy suites to intervene in these relationships. So Respect Now Always conducted an independent survey of university students to gain insights, real data, into what's happening in sexual assault and sexual harassment. And 30,000 students responded to the survey with a huge amount of qual and quant data created. Now, half, 51% of students were sexually harassed at least once in 2016. And 6.9% of the students surveys, surveyed were sexually assaulted. 26% of the students who had been sexually harassed had been harassed in a university setting women were twice as likely to be harassed as men and three times more likely to be assaulted and yes men were the perpetrators okay now what was important in this early survey 2016 is trans and what was then called at the time gender diverse students were more likely to be harassed sexually harassed in a university setting than cis men and women and it keeps, up, keeps going on, Indigenous and students with an impairment or disability were more likely to be harassed than non-Indigenous or hegemonically abled students. So can you see how vulnerability and difference is exploited by a predator? Postgraduate students were 
twice as likely as undergraduate students to have been sexually harassed. Now, most of those students that were surveyed did not implement any formal complaint process and bystanders to those incidents took no action. Okay, let's update this story. A follow-up survey was completed. Now, they had different questions, so it's not transferable. It's not, there's no longitudinal capacity in this study. So it was a separate study was released in 2022, this year, the year that I'm recording this post. And it was called the National Student Safety Survey. It was found that one in six students had been sexually harassed with gender diverse students reporting the worst treatment. So 13.7% of transgender students and 22.4% of non-binary identifying students stated they had experienced sexual harassment since they commenced university education. This survey also showed a huge increase in online harassment, particularly the movement of nudie pictures online. Great. But the report also confirmed that one in 20 students had been sexually assaulted since they started university and one in six students had been sexually harassed. Wow. Now this was from a survey data set of 43,189 students. So from these studies, a series of policy guidelines emerged pretty quickly. And there was one nested series of policies called, quote, respectful supervisory relationships, right? So this was from Universities Australia, the National Tertiary Education Union, the Council of Australian Postgraduates, and the Australian Council for Graduate Research. And those organisations got together and made the following statement, quote, our organisations recognise that there is a power imbalance between students and their supervisors and a sexual or romantic relationship that occurs within this power imbalance raises serious questions about the capacity for consent and academic integrity. End of quote. Wow. They also stated that, quote, this is important, a sexual or romantic relationship between a student and a supervisor is never appropriate. End of quote. Never appropriate. They argued that it harmed the learning environment, summons a conflict of interest, and renders students vulnerable to exploitation. The focus must be on mutual trust, mutual respect, and clear expectations, roles, and responsibilities between all parties. So this is great, and this is important. How is this going to operate in the socialization of academic life? Remember, we've got long work days, little space for activities or leisure outside of that work, and students and supervisors have so much in common. You can see why these relationships blur. You can understand it. And also, to be frank, people of my age, 53, have seen the consequences on other humans when this behaviour is enacted. Now, my question is, after any of us have seen the damage that has been done, how could any of us ever cross a line or a border or a boundary? And the answer is, the border can be crossed if the academic doesn't know or doesn't care that a border is actually there. But we are in new times. These are different times. Professionalism in research, teaching and administration is required every single minute of every day. But the problem is that predators succeed. Predators get on. And yes, their fall can be mighty, <laughs> but academic culture has lived in this ambiguity for so long because it is adult education. That socialization of academic life that I talked about, that I saw at the start of my career in my disciplines where 90% 
over 90% of the men when they're late 40s, 50s and 60s and 90% of the students when they're late teenage years or their early 20s. That com combination never happens outside of university. So there's no sort of assistance or support because we never see it until we get to university. But the changes to the adult population in our universities. So we've got older students coming to universities. That sociological change has really been impactful. And our policies and procedures are a lot cleaner now. Again, always be wary of academics who demean or discredit policies and procedures. Oh, policies are rubbish. Be careful of that. Because what policies do is they configure a minimum standard of acceptable behavior. Now, policies get in the way of a predator as they're constructing their alternative worldview, their theater, their alternative context, because they need to pick a victim, someone who is challenged, vulnerable, moving through a difficult time. Policies get in the way of exploitation <laughs> and exploiters. And while a lot of the research focuses on obviously sexual predators, there's all sorts of predators that occur here. Emotional predators, financial predators, physical predators, and also, yes, sexual predators. The techniques of abuse to cite CE Dove's research is manipulation, coercion, harassment, and intimidation. All of these tactics are used to grasp power and maintain power. And the online environment has increased the nodes and the modes through which power can be gained, increasing the way in which someone can be tracked, tormented and abused. So if you think your supervisor is a predator, if you think your boss is a predator, there are particular behaviours that you look for and I am going to list them, okay? So this is the diagnostic bit. You're looking for an application of double standards. You're looking for belittling, demeaning or ridiculing, betraying trust, blaming others. You're looking for the creation of confusion and conflict, mocking, criticising appearance, name calling, demanding constant attention or silent treatment, humiliation, intimidation, lying, misleading through a mission, crucial, abandoning the person in a dangerous situation, destruction of personal property, interfering with a person's ability to eat and sleep, restricting movements, throwing objects, avoiding accountability, and yes, stalking. These behaviours, particularly when they're in concert, work with great effectiveness as the victims of the predator are increasingly isolated from their friends and their family and they start to live in this theatre, this reality created by the predator. Also, the predator uses what I call the secret army phrasing. So this originally comes from the 50s, from Sykes and Max's great work on uh, techniques of neutralization. Can I say the wonderful Brené Brown uses in her shame research, this secret army stuff. So what's a secret army? Well, predators summon a group of people that don't actually exist, a secret army. So everybody agrees with me, or everyone in the lab knows the problems that you're going through. We all know what you're going through. We know the problems. Now, now they don't. It's a secret army, right? So they lie, they deny, they distort the truth. They use weird phrases like, that's not how, how I remember it. That's not how I remember it. That didn't happen. Or that didn't happen in that way. Yeah, so this is the matrix of tactics that are used by the predator, and that's why it's so difficult to find them guilty of any particular inappropriate action. This is a culture, right? And rape culture is part of it, and I'm using that great phrase and research from Tracy Nichols. My respects, Tracy. But predators use everything, every tool to enable their power, and sexual harassment and sexual assault are two of their tools. So please remember that predators are deliberate, they're premeditated, they're hostile and they're violent. They are not irrational, they are not impulsive and they're not uncontrollable.
Academic life is not a fairy tale. As the wonderful Brown Miller has described it, academic life is part of a, quote, authority entitlement narrative, end of quote. I love that. So think about that. Through transparency and accountability, we are now questioning that authority entitlement narrative. Reading the research this week, the harrowing case studies and remembering all the tragedies I've seen in my career, I realise how little we all matter <laughs> to the people in power in our universities. Most of us are simply currency to spend to reinforce the power of the few. And you know what? We deserve better. So in the final stage of the post, let's go through, if you've recognised something here, then here are the five strategies to get you on and out of this situation. Let's do this. Strategy one. At the start of your candidature, remember I said start, at the start of your candidature, locate, read and understand the policies and procedures for student and supervisor relationships and make sure you include in that reading sexual harassment and sexual assault. Now I know it seems incredibly boring <laughs> to start with policies and procedures. Mm. Seems incredibly boring. It is not. Remember the proportion of students impacted by sexual harassment and sexual assault. If it doesn't happen to you, it is going to happen to a friend of yours. So locate, bookmark the sexual assault and the sexual harassment suite of policies. But also right at the start, right at the start, I want you to locate the names of people who can help you, the people who are responsible for caring for students when bad stuff happens. Get their names. So find health and counselling. Log their services. Find a name. Find an email address for people who are trained to provide you with help and support. And most importantly, find an emergency phone number for health and counselling. Okay, secondly, find the name and the email address of your Dean of Graduate Research, your Dean or Centre for Graduate Research. That person can do something and that person must do something. Now, I am fully trained as a sexual assault and a sexual harassment investigator. I've done rape crisis training and I update that training on a monthly basis. I know what to do. So if you present at a graduate office or a graduate centre in a panic, in a moment of crisis, then they are the people that know what to do. They will help you. And getting you safe is the number one priority. You often hear me talk about creating a culture of safety, right? So when a student presents, the number one priority is to create a safe environment for them respecting their privacy. Now, this is important too. You can tell us your story. You own your story. You own your story. You tell it to me, but it is confidential. So you are in charge of where that story goes from here. Now, in these situations of sexual assault and sexual harassment, you have all the agency. The policy has ensured that you do. And support services exist around you, for you. And they're supporting your needs, explaining your rights. Now, I know policies and procedures get really poor responses from people. They seem to be really boring or bureaucratic or silly. They are not. Policies exist to create a culture of accountability and transparency and to configure minimum standards of behaviour. And also what happens next when those minimum standards are transgressed. Two, get safe. The number one priority in all discussions of you and a predator is safety. What does safety look like for you? What for you is being safe? Now answer that question for me. What does your safety look like? Now in these tips, I'm offering a series of strategies to enable your safety. But every human being has autonomy and rights over their body and the bits of their body that they decide to share. So if you are in an unsafe environment, 
however you may define that, then you have to use support and get yourself out of that context. But to do that, to remove yourself from an unsafe environment, you have to understand yourself. You have to understand your sense of autonomy and your relationship with the autonomy of others. You have to think about how you discover the limits of other people. This is important. Remember, this is about consent. It's about you, but it's also about the consent of others. It is tough, tough intellectual and corporeal work that we're doing here. And these limitations frame and change, not only as you change or other people around you change, but as policies and procedures and laws change. And that's why we started these tips with you understanding what are the policies about what are the forms of relationships that are acceptable between staff and students, students and students, and staff and staff. The priority in everything we do must be to render students safe so that you understand where you can and must draw the limits around your physical, emotional, intellectual and sensory life. So that means being very clear about what level of touching you are comfortable with. Are you comfortable with shaking hands, high fives, whatever? But noting that you have to understand your level of comfort and you have to articulate that level of comfort to others. Similarly, you have to listen to and understand the level of comfort of other people around you. That's how consent is formed because both of us, all of us, have a sense of what is a transgression and we have to speak the words so that transgression does not take place. Policies can help us, but we need to speak the words. So if you have been sexually assaulted or sexually harassed, then the number one priority is to get out of that location. Get away from that person, get away from those people. Get safe and go to a location, a context that can give you safety. So three examples, go to security on campus, go to health and counselling on campus, go to your office of graduate research on campus. The priority is to get yourself out of immediate harm and know where those three locations are on campus. Now in the case of online sexual harassment and sexual assault, in some ways this is easier because you've got the email, you've got the message. Immediately get a screen grab immediately and store it, save it on multiple locations. Then send it on to IT services as well as those other three locations on your campus. Yep. So today you've got some homework to do. What does being safe mean to you? What are your borders? What are your boundaries? And how do you express those to others? So you've got to be proactive rather than reactive in these times. Log and record the details in your organisations that render you safe. Three, tell people what is, hap what, what is happening and write down those details. So sexual assault and the sexual harassment literature have an overlap with the bullying literature in this regard. All this literature confirms two truths. Firstly, the importance of bystanders noting this behaviour, intervening in this behaviour and logging this behaviour with others. And the second truth is record keeping, logging the incidents in terms of time, date and location. Put all of those details into Microsoft calendars, but also ensure that a record of these events, that a record is held off campus, as well. It is absolutely crucial that you do this, whether or not you make a decision to enact disciplinary procedures later on. You must write notes and the details of the events. Do that for me. Further, when the event happens, it is really, really important to tell people. Tell your friends, tell your parents, tell a counsellor or a colleague, tell your Dean of Graduate Research. And remember, as I've said, this can be a confidential exchange. Just because you speak the words doesn't mean it goes anywhere else. You have control over your own life. But also, and this is important for all of us today, when all of us as bystanders witness something weird, or strange or awful 
then make sure we all, we've got our phones, log the incident, log the time, log the location, and approach the person who has been subjected to this odd behavior and ask, hi, are you okay? Not sure what's happening here, but do you need some help? Now, so often, too often, the, di the difference between a person being believed and having credibility and being dismissed is the testimony of a bystander. That's not right, but it's true. It's up to all of us to stand up, be a good person, be a good person, come on, be a good citizen, speak up, show support, show some courage. That is how we make change. I also want to log what bystanders can do, people that are witnessing the behaviour of the predators. In researching the post this week, I read the really amazing work of Hilary Hawkins about how to help a friend who has been raped or abused. And the best bit of the book was she offered a series of questions to ask a person in a difficult time. Because, you know, there's always, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, in this great work, she provided the questions to ask, the modelling. How are you doing today? How are you sleeping? Do you need to talk? Do you want a hug? Do you want to do something fun today? What can I help you with? You know it wasn't your fault, right? And how are you coping with what's happening? Now, if you don't know where to start to help somebody, those questions are a great starting point. Four, keep your door open, literally and metaphorically. Now, team, I've done this since I was a senior tutor at Murdoch University in 1992, before most of you were actually born. Now, I've always left my door open when I'm seeing students or colleagues. Now, I do this firstly because oxygen is life. Air circulation is important, but my open door policy has been a punctuation of my life, not only so that people feel free to walk into my office and talk with me, that's great, that's important, but also that I am safe, that there are no secrets and I'm not vulnerable to weirdness. And yes, I have had weirdness where students have tried to physically attack me and rough me up. I have experienced that. And also, I don't want any whispers about me playing favourites with anybody. My door remains open to confirm my availability, but also to confirm my safety. So think about this in your own life. Think about the importance of accountability. Stop pseudo-intimacy. Remember that cliche around the phrase, behind closed doors. Well, don't allow that to happen. Start to live your life, metaphorically and physically, with an open door. And five, establish a very, very clear public and private divide in your life. Team, the world has changed in the last 20 years. Our universities, the relationships between students and academics have changed. And most of these changes have been radical improvements, full stop. Now, I don't even these days have a cup of coffee with students in a coffee shop. I have a meeting once a week. I read my students' work. I care for them very deeply. But there is a rigid division between my public and my private life. I don't have middle class meals in the home of colleagues. I don't do that stuff. I don't go to a pub after a seminar. Work is tightly framed and controlled. My leisure, my private time is my business. It is my business. And these worlds don't connect anymore. Now I know this seems rigid. And can I say so many academics get passionately angry with me when I talk about this because they want to go to the pub with their students after a seminar. They want to go, you know, on a sort of orientation trip with the lab once a year on weekends away. And look, that's their call. It's not illegal. It's legal. It's your call. But I don't do it. And I don't recommend that other people do it. The world has changed. So when you are thinking about the limits of your safety, what makes your body feel safe? 
Also be very clear how you separate out your public and private life, your working life and your leisure life, and the PhD and the rest of your life. These divisions matter and let me tell you why. Because the predator wants your private life to bleed into every other element of your life. So there is no separation. They want to manipulate you and they want to use every bit of information that you give them to hurt you. Don't give them that information. Preserve the bulk of your life away from the workplace. Value privacy and that capacity to construct and preserve your privacy destroys the methodology of the predator. Thank you so much for taking me by the hand as we've walked through this discussion this week. We've all got some truths to think about in our life from this point. We have to acknowledge that we all have the right to learn. We have the right to be safe. We have the right to sit in trust, not in fear. We have a responsibility to occupy our present and to never turn away from oppression. We have a responsibility to believe in policies that shine a white light of transparency onto predators. We have a responsibility, all of us, to create a safe culture every day. We gain from creating a culture that separates the professional from the personal. It was the legendary Cornell West who said it best, quote, justice is what love looks like in public, end of quote. And yes, it is time for some justice. I wish you love, light and peace. Yeah.